Our presentation is about SUDS maintenance and whole life costs. I'll take about 10 minutes, hopefully, if I take any longer, Jen will be giving me uh, an unusual look. But we're just going to cover some of the things that uh, Transport Scotland has been involved in and talk about the whole life cost tool uh, that's available on the Scots website, but I'll, I'll talk about the detail behind that. Now, one of the first things I thought before we came along today is what is whole life costing and one, two of the, these are two of the headings uh, that uh, we took forward when we developed the whole life cost tool. Um, uh, whole life cost analysis, uh, as I'm sure you can all read, identifies the most cost efficient solution to a problem. Uh, that's thinking about all the aspects of uh, the construction and maintenance of a particular project or a service drainage system. And when I, uh, I, was, I, had an inter I was discussing recently with one of our colleagues that heads up our maintenance uh, delivery section, and he was m mentioning that the maintenance aspect of a project is 95% of the, of, the, of the project. The interesting part, the cutting of the ribbon, that's only about 5 or 10%, not the most important part. It's the maintenance part that's the most important part. I'm sure everybody says that, but I actually believe him. Uh, and whole life carbon is really about looking at carbon and the same aspects, looking at the construction carbon and the whole life uh, carbon. I just thought I'd quickly go through some uh, slides that show the perspective of why uh, whole life costing, uh, asset management and, and SUDS is important. Uh, we're living in times of uh, uh, austerity, as uh, so we're continually told, and every, every pound or uh, every uh, element of expenditure is, is even more important that we make sure that it gets extra, va extra value. Uh, the other drivers are climate change, and that's some of the things that Transport Scotland is extremely interested in. I'm sure everybody is, but uh, we, uh, it's an increasing topic, uh, uh, greater and greater emphasis. But over the last few years, we carried out a few studies, by, one by Jacobs in 2010 and another one in 2008, but obviously in more intense periods of rainfall. But one of the key things that we're looking at is identifying the, the uh, sections of the, our asset that have, has flooding issues, and that's where we're thinking we're focusing our efforts, similar to the approach the highways agency are considering that we mentioned, was mentioned earlier. But I, I thought I'd spend a, just quickly go over a history of SUDS in Scotland. Um, uh, our colleagues in SEPA have mentioned to us a few times and to others that it's not just a good idea, it's the law, it's encapsulated in legislation, and uh, the Water, Environment and Controlled Activities uh, legislation requires that discharge from runoff from roads uh, have a SUDS system and they continually emphasise two, le two levels of treatment. Uh, and to to drive all that forward in Scotland, uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, the SUDS Working Party, of which I have been a member for the last three or four, have been driving forward SUDS within Scotland, building up case studies, building up documents, delivering best practice. We do, uh, the, the group I was involved in developed the SUDS for Roads document that we saw earlier. Uh, and that th these are the, the drivers and, and sort of current position that we are uh, in relation to SUDS. But one of the slides I also saw uh, from SEPA at, at a recent presentation talked about everybody working together. And uh, I, I, I think that, that, res that certainly resonated with me. Some of the things that we do uh, is about coexistence, where uh, each organization involved in solving the problem has their own agenda and works in a particular way, but maybe doesn't work quite closely together. And then uh, maybe we get to cooperation, coordination, and really where we're trying to be in Transport Scotland and when we're working on asset management and SUDS, is, is to work in a collaborative way with all the organisations. I think the SUDS working party is a good example of that, but there's, there's much more we can do, uh, particularly in relation to the Flood Risk Management Act, uh, uh, organisations working together. Uh, I'm going the wrong way now, I think. Oh, it's all gone horribly wrong. Uh, yeah, uh, and in terms of working together, one of the things that we thought was uh, uh, a key driver and over the last, or a key uh, decision and direction that we should take forward over the last six months, uh, we recognised the need on the back of Flood Risk Management Act, uh, some research opportunities that are coming to the fore, and I'll talk about these in a minute, is to set up a Transport Scotland drainage group uh, with a TRL secretariat developing a collaborative approach with our stakeholders, such as the operating companies, uh, perhaps Scottish Water and others, uh, to look at our drainage asset and how we can improve that drainage asset, get better value for money for it, and the four objectives that we've determined are appropriate to emphasise. We do all these things, but to, to, to deliver them uh, better, 
is to record the location of the various drainage types, categorise and record the location of flooding incidents that I was mentioning earlier. But I think the key thing is to we need to look at the condition of our drainage asset and how we can categorise how uh, categorise how it performs um, and, and work towards um, uh, developing a concise uh, guidance document that, uh, notwithstanding the DMRB and all the other good advice that's out there, a guidance document that's useful for us in terms of the drainage assets that we have. And some recent progress on that is um, we're, we have developed a piece of uh, research that we're taking forward with Carnell. Uh, it's, it's just underway, um, but they, they came forward as one of uh, the partners uh, of an operating company and have also developed a, a, a ground penetrating radar technique that they've used to look at categorizing uh, the quality of filter drains in, term, in terms of how well, how they are, uh, how, how sediment has um, deposited within the filter drain and how we can categorize the performance. But the other tool that we've developed, working with the SUDS Working Party and, and in particular Scots, who led on the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation in Scotland, who led on this particular exercise task, was SUDS for Roads Whole Life Cost Tool. And the next three or four slides just go through that and explain how that tool works. It's available on the Scots website. Uh, it's, a, it's a spreadsheet with a series of algorithms and background data that support it, a guidance manual, uh, and uh, it is being used in Scotland, but we're seeking other uh, others, uh, organizations to use it and feedback information so we can improve it. That's the, the website webpage. It uh, uh, has a guidance manual. It, that's, that's, that's the front page of the Scots website, and uh, I'll show the, the, the link to it later. Uh, there's, there's three or four there were three or four steps to developing the tool. Uh, step one was to identify the key design parameters that organize, or users of the tool would wish to consider when they pull in information in relation to SUDS assets and develop a costing for SUDS. Uh, and in relation to a swale, it would be the width type of swale and the outlet. The, the key pieces of information that, that relate to the design of a swale. Uh, the next aspect was, uh, and um, it, uh, my uh, regards to Nicola Vemi, Vemi of Halcro, who developed the tool for uh, Scots, uh, but uh, some of these slides came from Nicola, but I can answer questions on some of the detail if there's any questions later. But we identified the construction and operational costs using standard bills of quantities and, and uh, dimensional analysis from the, the cross sections and also standard, standard rates from uh, uh, st uh, construction uh, and pricing documents. I suppose the key aspect of the tool is, the, one of the key aspects of the tool is the sediment removal model, which looks at um, the deposition of sediment, and there's, there's a, a tool and a component of that that works out based on the flow rates and, and type of suds detail, what the deposition will be, and what, therefore, what the, the maintenance regime should be. So that, that, that dials into that particular uh, aspect of uh, uh, analysis. It also looks at whole life carbon using uh, carbon factors from the University of Bath and Transport Scotland are, are also developing a carbon management system that uses the same factors. Uh, but but those, those factors were developed specifically for the particular assets that looked at within the whole life cost tool. And this is a, 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 a sort of diagram that shows how the whole life cost tool works. Um, the general information, input information on the left hand side. Uh, one would, uh, when one's using the tool, one would consider the particular treatment or asset that one's looking at, and it would, it would, it, the tool would use algorithms as, as indicated by the graphs at the left and right. There, they would, they would calculate actual figures. Um, that, that, that's a, an indication of the spreadsheet. You probably can't see that very well on the right-hand side, but I think uh, then my next two or three slides will show a comparison of a uh, swale and a pond, and, and notwithstanding the comments made earlier, the idea is to, to use a, a, a cost comparison looking at the construction cost and the maintenance cost of a swale and a pond. And this, this is the outputs from uh, information that was fed into the actual tool. You can see that the construction cost of the swale is lower, but the construction cost of the pond is higher. Although the maintenance cost, uh, allegedly from the tool feeding the information in, is higher, and the construction, the maintenance cost of the pond is lower. But in total, well, in total, the swale has got a higher whole life cost. 
the algorithms within the tool uh, have calculated this result, but also the input, the, the dimensions of the swale and, and the performance of the swale in the pond have done the same sort of thing. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons we developed the tool was to provide clarity between uh, the, 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 the water uh, servicing authority, the water authority, the developer, the, the planner, the local authority, so that uh, the people that are constructing the project uh, understand what the costs are, the construction costs, but also under, there's, a, there's a clarity in, in relation to the maintenance costs. So that, uh, that those adopting uh, a particular uh, asset can see, can see uh, where, where the costs lie. Uh, and that's, that's the, uh, the web link at the bottom. It's on the ScotsNet uh, website. Uh, I'd like to hand you over to Jed Mitchell now, who will talk through uh, some of the detail behind some of the drainage that we have on uh, the Scottish Trunk Road Network. Hi there. Uh, I'm going to put two hats on today. I work for Bear Scotland, who are one of three operating companies who manage and maintain the Trunk Road Network on behalf of Transport Scotland. But I'm also based at Aberdeen University one day, we're doing a PhD looking at clogging characteristics in suds, and in particular filter drains, which are quite common on the Scottish Trunk Road Network. Um, in particular, I'm looking at runoff particle size distribution, so I don't want to get too technical on the whole thing, but I'm looking at the sediment size ranges and how the sediment gets on the road. I'm looking at how it builds up on the road and how that impacts on the, the suds feature, and I'm looking at design and maintenance, so in the bottom right-hand corner here, when they're constructing this filter drain, is that best practice? How does that affect the whole life cost of that filter drain? Um, in an ideal world, you'll hear, hear people saying, that a filter drain should act like this. So brand new, 2.5, and the sediment will build up. And after 10 years, it'll be completely filled and it'll be ready to get emptied. Now, I've been doing research on this area for three years, and I've never been able to find where this 10-year figure come from. And from all the testing that I've done in the network, which I'll show you in a little while, that 10-year figure is very inaccurate. It just seems to be somebody that's plucked that out of the air as a, a best guess, and it really isn't that good a guess. Um, I'm looking at... There's three different types of clogging characteristics, physical, biological, and chemical. I'm very much looking at physical, because that's where most of it happens. Um, this is the type of things that I'm looking at. So in the bottom left-hand corner, this is a totally crusted filter drain. Now, my particular uh, interest in filter drains is when it crusts along the top, and you lose a lot of the asset, because there's a lot of void space underneath. And this is the type of things that you could end up getting happening. You get the water running across the top, and uh, given enough, this carriageway had to be shut down because the water was on the carriageway. Very dangerous. And this is in another uh, example here. And what you tend to get is, and a lot of filter drains, not all, but certain locations at certain times, in certain environments, you'll get this happening. So after about two or four years, you'll start to get this kind of clogging learn. I don't know why this happens yet. This is what my current research is looking at. I've got some labs um, that are currently trying to work out why this happens. So I'm looking at different sediment inputs under different flow characteristics with different stone matrix within the filter drain to see how that impacts on this evolution of this. And this is what you end up getting. You end up getting this, so what happens is after five years, the client has to pay if they're doing it to come in and replace this when they could have extended that lifespan of that filter drain by about another five, 10, 15 years, depending on where it is. So why does that really matter? Well. If you look at it purely from a roads engineer's point of view, I used to be a roads engineer, so I could put my roads engineer's hat on, that is very dangerous. Um, this lorry up here will plough through that okay. If you put a motorbike in that situation at high speed on a high speed 70 mile of road, that could be fail. So that's very critical. And in the bottom one, it's not the greatest picture, but you see how the, the filter drains here, and there's ponding at the bottom of the filter drain following the flow. That's actually drop curbs for people with uh, disabilities to cross or older people to cross the carriageway. So we're asking them to plough through that water, so it's really not good. Um, so implications of clogging, you get a loss in performance. So we had a major flooding event on the road. We were caught, caught up in the pipe when we found that there was vegetation growth inside. The one on the bottom left, totally had to take all of that out and start again because we said it was so compacted and this is just a sh doing trial pits to work out where, why things are happening. Um, Quickly look at some of my research. I'm not going to bore you to death with this. I've, last year I took 21 filter drain samples um, from different filter drains right up the east coast of Scotland. Raining filter drains from 1993 right up to 2010. Now when I plotted this graph, what I was expecting to find was that the sediment would be up on the left hand side and it would tail off as we got new. And what you can see is that's not what happens. 
And at first I scratched my head trying to work out why there's this graph so all over the place. But in a bit of investigation, interestingly, the two filter drains that I tested that had surface crusting were the ones that both had the most amount of sediment. The second one was the ones that had the least amount of sediment were the ones that had such pre-treatment. Because what you've got to remember is when you look at these filter drains that I'm looking at, they're over the top. They take everything off the carriageway unless you put a grass strip in. And these ones all have a grass strip, so the grass strip catches the sediment, so you increase the asset life of that filter drain. And very quickly, this is the PSD, so the particle size distribution of the sediment that's in the filter drain. And what you can see is here, bear in mind this is the whole east coast of Scotland. This tells me that environmental factors influence greatly the PSD and then therefore the clogging characteristics in the filter drain. So what I'm trying to say is you have to be very clever when you specify a filter drain. For the roads engineers in here, I would imagine most of them design the road, lovely dub jubbly, and then they'll just put a trench in at the side of the road and throw the, the stone material in the filter drain without any great thought to what they're doing because that's always been the way. Here's the grass strip that I'm talking about. Now, I've put this slide up because this is a very interesting one. This grass strip's not been specified very good. It's not wide enough. So when we had the, the um, Scotland, we had two severe uh, winter weather events over two years. This um, was destroyed. So I took a particle size. So I took sediment sample in PSD in 2008, again, and it was totally a different sediment analysis. So I just showed you that grass strips are good, but you have to be very clever about how you do them as well. Another thing that I've recently discovered is that um, when you have a structural barrier, you get a much higher sediment load in your filter drains. So if you look at the bottom left, when you have a curb line next to a filter drain, you'll see where it's at surface crusting, and then it starts to improve as further on. I could take sediment samples at three different changes between 100 metres, 50 metres, 20 metres, and I'll get a different PSD, and I'll get a different sediment volume within my sample. Same with junctions, same with bus laybys and the exit arms roundabouts. So again, what I'm trying to suggest there is that when you're designing these things, if you're a roads engineer, or if you're planning your maintenance regime, you've got to be very aware of your environment and what you're in. Another thing that I've been looking at, as particularly to Scotland, and the trunk road, and it's a rural trunk road, most of it, is the farming input into that. Um, the top two and the one on the left at the bottom here are all farm related. Um, I've taken all of these photographs. The one on the top right, this was at a farm access junction. That sediment was for 100 metres along that road plus. And there's a gully at this point here, and that gully was absolutely caked with sediment. Now, I would imagine that that's maybe been emptied two months ago, and it's totally filled. And it's because of poor farming practice, same with the one on the left. There's no thought to what he's taking on the road network here. Bottom left-hand side, that's a ploughed field, flooding. It tips over onto the carriageway, taking all the sediment onto the carriageway. And interestingly, this one on the right-hand side here, I took a photograph here, but I took a photograph on the other side round, which I haven't put up, and you can see that you get a very um, large sediment particle size here. This was because of was local road deterioration. You go around the corner, you get a different sediment sample, and that's because you get, as you're going around the bend, you tend to have a different... Drivers will either slow down or they're braking because they're going around the bend. So you get a different force with the tyres and you'll get a much smaller sediment size going around the bend. So again, it's looking at local environmental factors when you're putting in drainage assets. Now interestingly, I've watched all the presentations today and everybody seems to put up gullies as block gullies, which is, I think, quite, quite interesting because that just demonstrates if you don't get the maintenance right, you're never going to get your asset to live its life. And this, if you can imagine what you're seeing in there, this is what's going into the filter drains on the end of carriageways because they're over the top. And some consequences of the poor maintenance. Now, again, from the road's point of view, from the safety point of view, if nothing else, the one on the bottom left, that carriageway had to be shut down because that's fatal. You're going to have deaths at the back end of that. And you can see the surcharge in the, in the filler drain. But it's not all doom and gloom. There is some innovative technologies that are on, coming onto the market nowadays. And you heard somebody mention Carnell earlier on. This is a company called Carnell who now are in situ cleaning filter drains. One of the arguments you always hear is that we don't like putting filter drains because you've got to close the carriageway to clean it. Well, this company, they could actually do it in situ. And the, the good thing about that is, bottom left hand side, that's all the sediment that's come out the filter drain. And what they do is they're able to put the, set the stone, the same stone back into the carriageway. So that ta technology, and amongst other things, for this one here, same company. Uh, I've got nothing to do with Carnell, by the way. I'm just saying that these are one of the companies that are appearing on the on the scene just now, and they seem to be doing very good practice. This is GPR, this is a ground penetrating radar. They could drive along the side of the carriageway at a good speed, and they could analyze the filter drain using GPR. 
and tell you what kind of sediment bulldog we've got without actually having to do any intrusive investigation. So they could do that probably four, five, six, ten times more than what you can do come along. Normally you'd come along and dig a trench and analyse what you've got. And this is the kind of output you get. Um, good because there's a lot of yellow, bad because there's a lot of purple, and varied because there's a mixture. And interestingly for me, for my, my PhD, I'm interested in the bottom one, why you get this kind of <laughs> a varied kind of a component there. So some conclusions from my research. Um, for filter drains on trunk road networks, remember, where you take, there's very little pre-treatment. Particles bigger than one millimetre tend to contribute to surface clogging. Because what happens is, if it's a road particle breaking up of a road, it enters a filter drain. And as sediment's entering with it, you get this bridging. And I've been able to prove that through some um, sophisticated scanning equipment that I use at the university, which I haven't put up today, because there's not have enough time. Um, you look at some of the research from um, clogging, when you look at Australia and uh, America in particular, they use them using infiltration trenches, and they'll tell you that all the cloggings down at the six micron stage, and they're right, but it's because they've got a lot of pre-treatment going on. This is a totally different uh, kettle of fish. Sediment buildup and surface uh, clogging are dependent on site-specific variables. I've taken a lot of tests of filter drains over a one kilometre chainage, and I get a different result along that chainage. So it's very difficult to then specify something that's going to work in all conditions. Um, you get a wide variation in buildup rates across catchments. Now that would be even, um, it's particularly relevant down in England where you've got much more higher volumes of traffic because there is a relationship between sediment buildup and volume of traffic because you've got more traffic, more tyres, etc, etc. Uh, Pre-treatment, if you put a grass strip or something in, it certainly will help. Um, particles, 50% in some locations, especially when you have the bad weather. Picture on the top right is very interesting. That's a filter drain there. And normally, under conditions like that, this vehicle would um, lean over to one side, but it's got so much sediment in it, it could support that vehicle. And that's me.